a clock there, Louise, if that's possible, uh, to not put Pete under pressure. Um, welcome, Pete. Good to see you again. Uh, you're our first speaker this afternoon. Um, please, in, in your own time, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my name's Pete Green. I'm at the University of Liverpool. And um, we have this project with NSG Pilkington. So they're making a uh, float glass where, um, as the glass cools, it sits on a bed of, of molten tin to ensure that it's extremely uniform. Um, and what we're doing is we're building a machine learned model that tries to predict um, glass quality from various properties of the furnace. So temperatures and pressures and so on. And it's quite hard um, for a number of reasons. So one of them is the timelines associated with the process. So if something happens right at the beginning of the process, then you might not see an effect on product quality for 72 hours. If something happens near the end, then you might not see an effect for four hours. And so we have to account for those time lags and try and learn those from the data at the same time as learning the underlying relationship. Um, there's a whole load of other stuff you have to think about when you apply machine learning to real world things. So we have outliers. Uh, that come about for various reasons. Scalability, so we're measuring data all the time, so our final solution needs to be able to keep absorbing new data. Modularity is key and it's forgotten a bit these days. Um, what that means is rather than one enormous model doing everything for us, we have a group of lots of model experts and if one of them is, for example, misbehaving, then we can remove it, retrain it and so on. Now, out of data performance. So if you apply the model and it's data-based in a region where you've never seen any data, then the last thing you want is for your model to be confidently wrong. It needs to have, uh, say, confidence bounds that expand to illustrate the fact that it's been applied outside of its kind of domain. So if I can have the next slide, please. Um, so this is what we've got at the moment. Um, the, the, it's regression, so that line you're seeing is predicting fault density 72 hours into the future. Um, and it's automatically deleting the outliers, so they're the red and orange points. It's running at the moment at the uh, UK5 facility with NSG Pilkington, so that's in St Helens, just up the road from Liverpool. It updates every 20 minutes, it says what it thinks is going to happen in the next 72 hours and we're at a stage now where it's about to influence decisions. So the model's starting to say things like, well, if you cool this bit down a bit, the glass might get better or uh, you, won't, you won't use as much fuel and the glass quality will remain the same and that kind of thing. So fingers crossed, trials are happening now. And, um, and yeah, we're number 16 in the exhibition hall if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. Ter terrific stuff. Well, well timed. Um, as well as leaving comments in the in, in the chat, we've got reactions enabled. So if you uh, want to show your appreciation for any of the speakers, feel free to send a thumbs up or a bit of a, a bit of applause by way of encouragement. And don't forget, you'll be able to talk to them later in the breakout rooms if you if you want to. Thanks again, Pete. That's that's great stuff. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Bertrand Delpech. Uh, thank you, Richard. I'm just waiting for the presentation. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. So our project in Brunel is investigation of a flat heat pipe for high temperature waste heat recovery in the metal industry. So what we're trying to achieve in this project is to recover heat that is currently wasted to the environment when uh, after the, the slabs are melted and then they're traveling from the furnace to the other heat treatment area. And then currently yes, this, this heat is wasted. So our idea is to recover this heat using a new technology that we developed in Brunel called heat pipes. So if I can have the next slide, please. So what's a heat pipe? Heat pipe is a sealed container with a working fluid inside that saturation. So when heat is applied to the bottom, the liquid inside the evaporator will start generate vapor that will travel then to the condenser section. Then the heat will be released to the heat sink, which can be air, water, thermal oil, or can also generate steam. And then the condensate would return to the evaporator through gravity. So we developed a heat pipe, uh, as you can see on the, on the right of the picture, of the, of the slide, where we have a uh, surface area of one square meter located just above the, 
hot slab that is traveling on the conveyor and which we, we are recovering this heat mainly through radiation and also natural convection. Um, so if I can have the next slide, please. Uh, our idea though for testing this system, we struggled to get uh, an industry to be able to, to get an area where we were able to test those uh, steel, uh, this uh, flat heat pipe. So we contacted one of our partner company in another project, which is an aluminum smelter, where they're recycling aluminum. So they melt the aluminum in large furnaces and then pour the aluminum in two uh, buckets, as you can see on the left uh, on the left of the picture here. So we have an aluminum slab at about 600 degree and we're going to try to recover this heat using the radiative heat pipe. Uh, you can see um, the test rig that we built on the right with a heat dissipation system. And this system is uh, ready now and will be shipped uh, next week to be tested on site uh, in GBMI in, uh, in, uh, in close to Sheffield. So just a, a, a few things about the advent, why we selected the heat pipe technology. Uh, we selected the heat pipe technology for a few reasons, such as uh, when we're talking about uh, radiation, we can have quite high heat flux. If you use normal heat exchangers, such as tube heat exchanger, or any type of other heat exchanger, you can have, uh, you can have hot, hot spot on the tube that can generate steam, that can just ruin the system. And also the efficiency of those systems are not very great. And also, finally, uh, from question we had to uh, some steel partner, they will not allow to have any water circulating above the slabs. In case there is a leakage, there can be easily explosion from the expansion of the water. So this is why we selected this technology. Uh, if you want to discuss more about it, uh, you can come to the breakout room. And if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer. Brilliant, Bertrand. Thank you. That's excellent. Um, and if you've been following along in chat, I see that Christine's reminded us that Bertrand's on stand 17. Um, so you can visit, uh, you can visit there later. Uh, and also I saw at least one detailed comment from, from Peter and uh, Christine in the background will also pick up some of that detail and put it on the, on the whiteboard for people to go back to later if you miss it in chat. So there's a lot going on in the background, but great stuff. Thank you very much again. Let's go to our third speaker, Zushu. I know that you're here because I've seen your name. It's my turn. At least Zushu was here. Have we lost him? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. There he is. Hey, uh, I thought we I thought we'd lost you. Are you well, sir? No, uh, I'm good. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Well, when when you're ready, we can start your presentation. Um, I can't see my presentation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Zhu from WFD University of Warwick. Um, it's great to be here to talk about our project on behalf of the team. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, um, the ultimate aim of this project is uh, with a number of industry partners, we want to develop an innovative process to convert uh, various industry waste to uh, value added raw materials for the glass industry by using blast furnace waste heat. And this foundation industry, uh, trans, uh, transform foundation industry network uh, plus project is to actually create the uh, fundamental knowledge and uh, um, skills uh, to support such a uh, development of such innovative process. So what we have done since this uh, feasibility projects, we have done uh, mass and heat uh, balance modeling and assembly dynamic modeling. We calculated the amount of waste heat, uh, waste can be taken by the process and then uh, the impact of those kind of waste on the operation parameters, uh, such as temperature and the viscosity. And we also observe, um, uh, observe the uh, dissolutions of those industrial waste into the molten uh, blast furnace slag. And we have done various trials or melting trials using the waste and uh, uh, characterize the waste um, using the advanced characterization technologies. And so the outcome of this uh, uh, feasibility studies, we proved that um, an innovative idea from the beginnings actually can effectively convert, uh, convert the industry waste to the raw materials for the glass uh, manufacturing. 
and it can reduce the energy consumption and then reduce the uh, consumption of, of virgin materials and uh, reduced carbon dioxide emissions in the glass manufacturing. And it's particularly a useful beneficial to the utilization of those um, hard to use uh, uh, ways such as um, recycled contaminated uh, uh, glass streams. So our recommendation is uh, uh, we will recommend the industry to industry to upscale this process, either in the pilot scale or in the industry uh, uh, scale. Next, please. So, mainly it's appreciated the, uh, uh, the, the funding from Transform Foundation Industry Network Plus and the industry partners Glass Futures, uh, British Glass Materials Process Industry and Calamide. And we hope the industry will take this uh, uh, process forward. Thank you. And thank you. Another, another great and useful presentation, I think. And, and Christine, again, is reminding us that uh, that is stand 18 in the exhibition hall if you want to go and find out, find out more. Uh, and if you're in the exhibition hall, grab a post-it. You can leave some comments there uh, and some feedback even before we go into the breakouts shortly. Um, so let me welcome uh, Gaurav, welcome to, uh, welcome to our meeting, and uh, you have the next presentation, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. So uh, I'm happy to present on behalf of my team. Uh, so the work uh, that we carried out has the twin objective. Uh, as uh, we wanted to utilize the paper mill sludge, which is produced during the production of paper, and uh, otherwise it's going to the landfill and creating greenhouse gas emission. So we wanted to utilize uh, this uh, material, which is considered waste, and uh, we wanted to substitute in making of fired bricks, which are normally made uh, utilizing uh, the fertile agricultural soil. So this way, we wanted to create it, uh, industrial symbiosis by partially replacing fertile agricultural soil with uh, paper mill sludge. Uh, next, please. So uh, because uh, in the UK, uh, 5 million tons of paper is produced every year. And because of that, uh, 0.43 million tons of uh, like uh, fossil fuel is being uh, consumed. And uh, because of the paper production, the UK is contributing 2.5% of total greenhouse gas emission. So the target was to utilize this paper mill sludge and uh, to develop the value added product in terms of uh, this fire brick by partially replacing the fertile agricultural soil. Uh, next, please. So we contacted the Confederation of uh, Paper Mill Industry and uh, then uh, we obtained uh, paper mill sludge uh, uh, samples from seven places. So the, these were uh, de-inking sludge uh, that were obtained from recycling of paper. So the material characterization of these uh, sludge was done. And it was found that uh, this material is, uh, the paper mill sludge uh, material is uh, rich in cellulogic fibers and calcium carbonate. So, the material was uh, good to be substituted uh, with the uh, fertile agricultural soil uh, in terms of making fire bricks. So these uh, bricks were made and then, and then uh, the samples are already shown in the bottom left uh, picture. And uh, also we uh, calculated that in terms of that, if we continue making uh, fire bricks uh, in, by utilizing this uh, paper mill sludge, so we can achieve a good uh, greenhouse gas reduction because in the construction industry, as the target is to have net zero, so so the work would be a significant step in this direction, and we would like industry to take up uh, this work and uh, and support us in our endeavor. And uh, I'll be happy to discuss uh, more about this uh, uh, with all the interest uh, interested uh, participants uh, in the breakout room. So thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Thank you, Gaurav, that's, uh, that, that's great. Um, and uh, again, just to say, all these presentations are available in the exhibition hall. I just, I know you had some small, um, some small diagrams there, Gaurav, so I'm not sure we did that justice in terms of getting them on screen, but people can review the data uh, in the breakout room with you or, or, at their, or at their leisure. 
So great, thank you. Really, really interesting. Okay, one more, to, one more to go in this section before we head into the breaks out, breakouts. Aris, so you're with us. You certainly are. Your PC's on mute, Aris. So I just can't hear you at the second. I think Richard, there might be Aris might right. also be yeah. on another. Ah, you there? Yes. Yeah, the thing is with my laptop and the camera don't work, here, so I have the phone and I was listening on the phone and I had to get get the phone out of the. Anyways, yeah, don't matter. That, that's <laughs> that's absolutely fine. I I I think Aris, you are you're the victim of technology. Clearly, clearly, technology yeah. is, yeah. is not your friend most days. <laughs> but we are ready for your presentation so um we'll put it on we'll put it on screen and you can make a start for us all right uh so yeah we, we all know there's a there's an energy uh problem and uh, industry is a large part of that and our emphasis in the university of Birmingham, the center for energy storage is uh, heat because uh, heat is the majority of the energy demand in the industry and uh, so thermal storage, we think, it can be a leverage to this uh, problem uh, as it has the a flexible design and uh, this can make it easy to scale up as opposed to other technologies. And it can make it also a, a more uh, cost-effective method uh, to provide, to store and reuse uh, waste heat. And so in the next slide, um, so our uh, idea is to actually, uh, as, you, as you may well know, uh, uh, Latin heat is a very promising technology to store thermal energy. And uh, we are, but the, the problem with that, uh, particularly in high temperatures where you use uh, molten salts to uh, capture Latin heat gradients is that uh, they can be very corrosive and hard to handle. That's why we encapsulate them in, uh, uh, solid uh, matrices and the ideal matrix will be a material that has a very high specific uh, grain density, uh, good thermal conductivity and obviously doesn't react to the, to the material. So uh, we identified the spent uh, foundry sand uh, which is a byproduct from the metal casting process as a good candidate for this uh, as, as a good candidate to encapsulate the, the molten salt, so our phase change material. So uh, the, the sand is typically uh, reused and dumped, and this, can, uh, this accounts for 4% of the turnover of the sand industry. And so we decided to use it, and we produce this, uh, what we call composite phase change material, as you can see in the image there. And then uh, this can, depending on the PCM, in our case is a multi nitrate salt. So the melting point is between 200 and 350 degrees, depending on the exact composition. So our material is targeted to medium high temperature applications. And uh, the setup would look like in the next slide. Uh, so we expect to have something like a packed bed arrange arrangement or, or as trays, as you can see there. So you would have the bricks, uh, pellets, as you would see inside there. And then the idea is to capture, of course, the waste heat. In our case, we study the use case in a foundry and then to reuse it either in a turbine or directly on a space heating application or use it on the source where you got it from. So uh, I hope you find this idea interesting. If you want to learn more about it, you can find us in the poster. Um, a bit. Thank you, Aris. I'm sure, so, you'll, I'm sure you'll have lots of, uh, lots of visitors. Um, so thank you, Aris, and thank you all of our speakers who've, who've just uh, added all that information to the, to the room, which is fantastic. Um... Right, my name's Phil Pennell. I have a long research history in cement and concrete, and as a result, I was asked to, 
to um, try and coordinate the cement technical working group. Now, one of the issues we have with cement, of course, is that many of the process, many of the CO2 emissions are down to the process rather than the use of energy. So even if we can manage to run cement plants on wind or unicorn dust or whatever, we've still got 60% of our carbon emissions. So the big deal for the cement and concrete industry is dematerialization. How do we use less material? How do we transform a foundation industry, which essentially makes its money from selling as much material as possible, as cheaply as possible into an industry that actually delivers high quality products and keeps control of those products throughout their lifetime. That's a real challenge for the cement and concrete industry, not least because of the lack of integration between cement and concrete, although that is changing. Um, but the one thing we have discovered in this process is the industry is on board. They want change. Thank you, Phil. Super job. Moving on, the next person we're going to hear from is uh, Dr. Ahmed Khalil from the University of Exeter. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can I start? We'll just wait till you're spotlighted, Ahmed, and then we'll, there we go. Yes, you, you can start. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as a ceramics technical working group, uh, Professor Shao Jang and I, Ahmed Khalil, a research fellow at the University of Exeter, collaborate with uh, Transfire work streams and various uh, foundation uh, industry partners in the delivery of some important uh, cross-sector case studies, uh, such as the factory recycling, spent foundry sand, and uh, uh, upcoming others, uh, in which we focus on producing durable uh, factories using uh, fewer uh, materials from sustainable sources. Uh, we seek to cause a real transformative change uh, within the foundation industries. For this purpose, we do our level best to identify the key intervention points and the drivers and barriers for this transformative change and its challenges and uh, solutions uh, through organized workshops. So please visit our uh, ceramics uh, related stand to know our film store. Ahmed, that's brilliant. Thank you for keeping the time. It's at this point, I always feel tremendously guilty for pressurizing the speakers, but th thank you very much indeed. And next, just, Justin, nice to see you again. Hello. Carry, carry on, sir, when you're ready. Okay, so hi, I'm going to go in front of the clock. Oh, no, I'm not. Anyway. Uh, hi, I'm Justin Perry, and I'm the co-leader of the Bolt Chemicals Technical Working Group with uh, Dr. Mark Unthank. Matt and I are chemistry academics at Northumbria University, and we have a long history of working between academia and industry and commercially oriented projects across the chemical sector from pharma for all the way through to the polymer chemistry industry. Um, also in the, the chemicals working group, we've got two postdocs and a PhD student, and together we're looking at projects which we're trying to span the foundation industries. And we're keen to talk to those of you who are interested in chemistry or just interested in working with chemists. Uh, we have a number of current topics and uh, keen to hear from you about uh, what you think about these and other potential areas for research. At the moment, we are looking at the reuse of product uh, byproducts from one process industry to the other. And we're also looking at polymer recycling and the use of uh, inorganic and biosource wastes in composites. Uh, we're keen to work with any sector company or academic who has something to contribute or wants to access this expertise. So show us your interesting issues, please. Thank you, Justin. And exactly that. If you if you want to collaborate with Justin or Justin's group, then feel free to post in chat or add it to the exhibition hall. Greetings, Paul. Good afternoon. Shall I go? Please do, sir. <laughs> Great. Good afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, my name is Paul Bingham. I'm Professor of Glass and Ceramics at Sheffield Home University. And I'm leading the Glass Technical Working Group on the Transfire Project. Now, most of you probably won't know this, but 2022 is the United Nations International Year of Glass. So it's very appropriate that we're trying to help our glass industry decarbonize, develop its skills and so on. So within, within the project, we're looking not only at, as Justin's just said, waste materials that we can maybe reuse as raw materials, we're looking at new technologies, we're looking at skills development, we're looking at equality, diversity and inclusion. Current work that we're undertaking includes benchmarking of current practice and materials, and we're going to be expanding that, looking at alternative raw materials and a number of wastes, byproducts and 
economic factors. Great stuff. Thank you, Paul. Good, good pitch for us. Uh, which brings us to metals and Masood. Yeah, I'm Masood. I'm a circular economy researcher working on transfer project at the University of Cardiff with Professor Rossi Sechi and Professor Sami Wans. Our team is focused on helping to transform the UK metal sector. Collaborating with our industry and academic partner, we're working on improving the flow of resources within and between foundation industries by contributing to various case studies, such as linking foundation industry to wind turbine end of use, spam foundry, sound waste management, and chrome aluminia slag case study. Please feel free to check our stand on exhibition hall, we are number three. And the link provided on the Padlet to know more about our work. Uh, we're looking forward to knowing more about you. If you would like to collaborate, have any proposal for a case study, or have any inquiry, please get in touch. Thank you. Super job, Masood. Thank you very much indeed. Time to spare. And just rounding off this, this session before we take a, a very short pause, uh, welcome, welcome, Simon. Hello. Um, so uh, I'll start. Um, oh, there's a timer. Uh, I'm Simon Curling. I'm from Bangor University in North Wales. Um, I'm the researcher on the pulp and paper thematic working group uh, led by Dr. Graham Ormondroyd. I'm also up here in Bangor. Um, we have the uh, pleasure of working with a truly renewable and uh, bio-based material. Um, there is some not, uh, inorganic material in paper as well but in terms of sort of uh, renewable materials paper is very good so we're interested in hearing um, people's comments and what questions they may have and any ideas they have especially in utilizing wastes from the paper making industry um, just from the breakout room just a moment ago there's obviously some interest in using and utilizing paper sludge so check us out on the mural site and come along to the breakout room later. Thank you, Simon, very, very much indeed. Great that you're getting some interaction in the breakout group. So very, very happy with that. Um, we're going to now just take... ...up again this time is Phil. Are you ready? Yes, I'm always ready. Thank you so Already. much. Let's, let's go. So the Thousand Cuts case study, how did this come about? Well, it's an old saw, but we'll repeat it anyway. It's the old British cycling team adage, where one of the ways in which you can make um, substantial and, um, and significant changes in your process is to look at how you combine um, cleverly lots and lots and lots of small modifications in order to make a big modification. So this is where the Thousand <laughs> Cuts name came from, though, which is looking at those <laughs> interventions that can be made across the foundation industries in reducing the amount of energy we use, reducing the throughput of materials, capturing waste heat and so on and so forth, which at the moment tend to be considered in isolation. What happens if we look at the most synergistic and holistic ways to combine those individual interventions to make sure that the sum, uh, the whole rather, is greater than the sum of their parts? So that's the ethos behind the Thousand Cuts case study. We haven't started yet. But we're very happy to hear any ideas that you might have. Thank you, Phil. And, that, and that's a great invitation from you and from all the speakers, which is, you know, there's, there's still time for people to engage with you, collaborate, share ideas and, and just be part of the conversation. So that's great stuff. Thank you. Paul. Thanks, Richard. Um, OK, uh, I'm leading the uh, spent foundry sound case today. Um, what is foundry sand? Well, obviously it's sand coming out of uh, metal foundries, of which we still have a very large number in this country. Um, the sand is a byproduct that cannot be fully recycled. It is currently recycled up to a point, but what that is resulting in is over 200,000 tonnes a year of material essentially going to landfill, which is unsustainable. Um, We've got landfill tax to pay, there's transport CO2 emissions associated with that. So it's, it's completely unsustainable. So we're trying to look for alternative uses within or external to the foundation industries for these materials. I'm conscious that there are some other presentations today on that topic, so I'll be hoping to hear from you guys. And we're looking right across the foundation industries 
and more widely for uses for that material. We're conscious it has been looked at previously, so contact us to discuss. Thank you. Good job, Paul. Thank you again. Thank you very much indeed. Which brings us to Anne. Hello. 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 Whenever you're ready. Great. All right. So uh, I lead a case study on linking uh, offshore wind, wind turbines uh, to foundation industries. So offshore wind energy is set to grow fourfold by 2030, and this will use millions of tons of materials from foundation industries, such as steel, copper, concrete, and glass fiber. At the same time, thousands of turbines will reach their end of use in the next 10 years as well. But supply chains for decommissioning, component reuse, and materials recycling are underdeveloped. So this case study will investigate how the loop of material flows can be closed from end of use wind turbines to manufacturing of new components in foundation industries, including the mapping of recycling technologies and higher value business opportunities in remanufacturing. So we're looking for collaborations with companies along the chain from foundation industries to recycling and removal companies and wind operators. So find out more about this case study in the breakout groups uh, and also at the virtual exhibition in stand for 13. <laughs> thank you. Super, Ed, thank, thank you very much. Yes, uh, that, that, that is absolutely right. So Christine's keeping us right, stand 13 for, uh, for Anne's presentation. Hi, Matt. Hi. Hi. Please go ahead when you are ready. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Matt Unthank. So I'm leading the case study in developing new products from high grade polymer particulate waste streams uh, based at Northumbria University. So this case study is really focused on utilizing existing high grade molecular and material waste streams from the foundation industries, using those as raw materials and new products. So we started by looking at molecular waste streams from Transfire industrial partners, particularly in the bulk chemical sector, but we're now expanding to include materials from metal, glass, and ceramic industries, particularly interested in the formation of polymer-based composite materials. So we've got a really good example that we've been working on in the development of alkyd coatings for the marine and protective coatings industry. In this example, we're, we're reprocessing waste PET flake, which currently goes to landfill, combining that with natural fatty acids and glycerol to make a sustainable bio and waste source polymer, which can then be formulated into an industrial composite coating. Fillers from other parts of the foundation industry are going to play a big part in this technology. And if you've got your own waste streams or ideas that are linked to this kind of concept, come and speak to me. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Great, great stuff. Good, good timing. And do look in the chat for my colleague Jonathan's appreciation of your uh, audio and visual <laughs> setup for that. Was, uh... <laughs> Honestly, Matt, he doesn't say that to many people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And for anybody who missed it, Christine managed to get to um, seven minutes past four without mentioning cycling, but then she cracked. So we're, we're there or thereabouts. Um, Ahmed, welcome. Welcome back. Thank you very much. You're our, you're our last speaker for this section. Please go ahead when you're ready. Uh, hi again. Um, our ceramics technical working groups case study focuses on recycling the spent uh, chrome alumina slag based refractories and zirconia molite waste for the production of high performance refractories aiming to decrease the resource consumption and reduce environmental pollution, resulting in the development of circular economy. These alternative materials are found in high amounts and can be incorporated into already produced refractory breaks during the processing to form reinforced ceramic products with uh, higher refractoriness, uh, strength, and other promoted properties. We are honored by the collaboration with our esteemed uh, project partners, Trent Parkinson, Spencer, and Mass uh, Metal Technical Working Group. For further information, please stay tuned today and come talk to us to learn more, I give your feedback. We are uh, number 10. <laughs> Stand <Great>. number 10. <laughs> That's great, Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. To, uh, time to gather their thoughts. Um, so, the, so the previous two sets were, were all about work being done by the working groups and case studies. This next set of set of presentations is all about moving forward. It's it's new projects which are in the process of kicking off, or they're or they're on or they're ongoing, um, and it builds on the work that you've that you've heard already. So we've got um, we've got six of these coming up, uh, and the first of these uh, is uh, from Dr. Chinwan Ki. I hope I'm saying that right. We haven't met, but uh, welcome to the meeting. Uh, thank you very much. That was perfect. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My pleasure to meet you. And my name is Yuan Ki. I'm currently a lecturer in sustainable material for construction at the University of Bath. The research I'd like to talk about today aims to provide to improve the resource efficiency and sustainability of cross-sector foundation industry by utilizing solid waste for direct CO2 utilization, and in the meanwhile, producing alternative fixed stock materials for cement industry that have the potential to bear negative imported carbon. So as by today, most of the foundation industry are still operating under the conventional linear production process, which means that flume gaps that contain concentrated CO2 are released directly into the atmosphere via arc like solid waste, as, such as cement king dust, biomass energy steels like are primarily disposed through landfill storage. So my research will help the foundation industry to shift from the linear production process to the novel circular production process by developing innovative green chemical process that can effectively utilize this alkali waste for direct CO2 minimization at much higher efficiency and lower cost comparing to existing process. So as the process still ongoing, we're looking forward to share more exciting results in the coming weeks, months. So please check my poster at stand 21 and there's a link to my research website where I would post more recent updates. So sorry for slightly overrun the time. Thank you. That'll be okay. Thank you so much. Really, really enjoyed that. Thank you. Which Richard, I'm unable to locate Stephen in the room. Yes, I was just having the same. I was just having the same moment. So what we'll do is, until we track Stephen down, unless he makes himself known, we'll move on to Christina if she's here. Hi. Hi, Christina. Yeah, yeah, yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Marvelous. Thank you. So hello everyone. I am Christina Valles from the Department of Materials, University of Manchester. The title of our project is Sustainable Replacements for Coal Tar Pits Binders. Coal Tar Pits, CTP, is a residue formed from the distillation of coal tar and is widely used in industry as a binder to form carbon electrodes, seals, specialty graphites for electric brushes and current collectors, just to mention a few examples. However, CTP is fossil derived and toxic and has recently been classified as a sunset status material under REACH. Thus, a sustainable alternative is essential for the foundation industries dependent on these materials. Wood tar biopit shows promise as a safe and renewable binder. So in this project, we will combine the proposers and Morgan's know-how for an intense six-month research program to take wood tar biopits from TRL1 to TRL2 and identify the technical and processing challenges for industrial uptake. If you are more interested in this, in this project, please come and visit my poster. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. It's super job. Lovely. We'll keep going and welcome Sylvia. Hello. Hello everyone. Um, let me know when I can start. Okay, so this is uh, Sylvia Tedesco from Manchester Metropolitan University and my resource efficiency project investigates a possible symbiosis uh, between the paper and the construction sector through improved valorization of paper sludge. So the concept exploits the anaerobic digesting technology for the production of biogas as a renewable energy carrier, as opposed to incineration for energy recovery. And it also evaluates the post digestion digestion uh, by product for use as a, a water substitute for the concrete making. Uh, so in this project, we are assessing the biomethane potential of paper sludge and testing concrete mixes at different grades of water replacement with digestate against the structural standards for the building sector. So if you want to know more, please visit our murals poster in number 24. And I'd love to talk to you about the different types of organic waste that you can valorize through anaerobic digestion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia. I can see you, you take pride in just hitting that four zeros there perfectly. Well done. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Nice to see you again. Hi, Richard. Hi. When right. Good. good. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Sam Edua Mankwa. I'm based in the School of Civil Engineering, University of Leeds. My research centers on circular economy and carbon reduction strategies for the cement and concrete industries. 
In my TFI Network Plus project, I'm collaborating with Luxfire, and together we're exploring the feasibility of using magnesium-rich draws to produce ceramics for niche applications in the construction, nuclear, and bioengineering, uh, biomedical engineering. Currently, the magnesium oxide for producing such ceramics come from decarbonization of magnesite and dolomite through carbon and energy intensive processes. This project will explore alternative raw materials. You're welcome to visit uh, the project mirror stand to see details of what we're doing and how we're looking to achieve the project aims. I'm looking forward to discussing opportunities for valorizing uh, waste from different industries. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. I'm sure you'll get lots of visitors for that. So certainly hope you do. Uh, yeah. That's going to bring us to our last speaker for this section, uh, Aris. And I see Jonathan's just asking you to make sure you've got your camera on, Aris, so we can find you. Here I am, yeah. Here he, here he is. Well, welcome back. Your second, your second pitch of the day. Great. When, whenever you're ready. Uh, yeah. So, so we talked a bit before about the uh, about the thermcast. So the the the, the sun therm is essentially a sort of continuation program. So as part of thermcast, we uh, developed the novel material to capture heat in uh, medium high temperature applications, uh, which is based on the on the uh, waste sand from the foundry industry. And then on this project, the, the, the sun therm, what we're trying to do is to actually uh, design and uh, demonstrate the technology uh, based on this material. So uh, uh, this involves uh, uh, everything from system design to uh, procurement, uh, modeling, optimization, and so on. It's actually quite ambitious because uh, the time scale is small. And uh, uh, the the goal is to actually uh, get this to a sort of let's say TRL four to five, so uh, have a system uh, based on data from a foundry, from waste foundry source and the waste foundry induction furnace, and uh, uh, showcase how the heat can be captured and stored from that. So, if you, if you want to learn more about it, please come have a look at the poster session. So, that's great, Aris. Thank you, and I'm sure I'm sure. People will. In fact, they might uh, they might come and speak to you about all kind all kinds of things.